Okay, welcome back live here inside theCUBE. This is SiliconANGLE and Wikibon's theCUBE, our flagship program where we go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined by my co-host Dave Vellante. John, it's great to be with you here today. Dheeraj Pandey is here. He's the CEO of Nutanix, uh, co-founder and uh, innovator. Dheeraj, welcome back to theCUBE. Thank you, good to be back. So you guys have got this cool shirt on and, uh, and I want one. <laughs> you know, absolutely, so absolutely. I'll come by a booth, I'll you know, do whatever trick I have to do to get one, but, uh, <laughs> but so you guys are on a, on a rocket ship. Um, it's been unbelievable. So give us the quick update. Uh, to what's, what's happening with Nutanix? Um, yeah, in fact, so far so good. I'm going to cross my fingers. Um, companies come a long way ever since we spoke last. Mm. Uh, close to about 300 employees now, about 25 countries. Um, we were all on VMware when we talked last, and since then we've actually shipped uh, things on Hyper-V and uh, KVM as well. So, I mean, what we're really trying to do is build a very simple um, IT fabric, you know, for storage and as well as for systems management. What was the big, go back three years when you were you know, starting the company, you know, you hadn't got funding yet or whatever. What was the big bet that you guys made at that time? You know, we were looking at uh, three or four different uh, innovations. One around Hadoop, which was trying to collapse compute and storage, uh, and trying to empower the uh, Java guys to go and do analytics and data warehousing uh, using Java. We looked at uh, Google's data center, we looked at Facebook's data center, we looked at Oracle Extra Data. We said they're all trying to collapse compute and storage and deliver a solution to, to the end user. And he said, you know, all these silos of uh, Oracle's ecosystem and Google's ecosystem, Facebook's ecosystem, and Hadoop ecosystem, uh, there is some value in generalizing this concept of uh, collapsing compute and storage. What if you brought this to the masses? And uh, I think uh, we looked at the first big math application, and virtualization was one such math application. And uh, we started digging deeper into storage for virtualization, and it was completely broken. So, you know, that's how the company really began. It's like, let's collapse compute and storage, Let's deliver an end-to-end -end solution to the virtualization guy, to the cloud guy, uh, and uh, it's all about simplicity. At the yeah, end. at the time, there weren't a lot of re reference examples. Uh, uh, you mentioned Exadata, and at the time, at the time it was probably Exadata and HP, right? It really wasn't even that converged. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dheeraj, one of the things we were talking about before you came on, and, we've, and you've been on theCUBE before as a CUBE alumni, so we've been around the block, you've been around the industry for a while. Um, you're seeing a massive disruption. We've been talking transformation for three years on theCUBE, and, HP had some disappointing earnings, replacing top executives like Dave Donatelli, uh, IBM's retooling, Microsoft Palmer's uh, resigning. The old guard is shifting, they have to make the changes. This is evidence of the disruption that we talked about two years ago when you were on theCUBE. The enterprises are up for grabs. And modern errors here, we're hearing it here on theCUBE again. Applications are, follow the applications, application centric, et cetera. What is, what is your take on this? I mean, obviously you've had the finger on the pulse for two years, you're ahead of the curve, thought leader. What's your take on what's happening right now? Uh, is it evidence that cloud is disrupting and causing people to make the shifts? Are people being impacted on a business basis with the results we're seeing? What's your take on all this? Yeah, I think you, you said it right. Uh, every 10, 15 years there's disruption of some kind, and this time around it's around you know, technologies like flash and around software defined, and also around the cloud. I mean. Today, what Amazon can do in a matter of seconds, HP's and IBM's and Dell's will take months to set that kind of infrastructure up. I think it's uh, the velocity of consumption is actually, you know, really. Sh I mean, it's just growing to that extent where you don't have to wait for months before you can bring up virtual machines and so on. Uh, and at the same time, you look at people like uh, Jeff Bezos, who being rewarded for making losses, right? So that's the biggest disruption of them. How do you go and compete with that, right? I mean, he goes and talks about, oh, we had a $16 billion quarter, and he made $7 billion in losses, right? 
So gross margin is actually up for grabs. Where And by the way, Amazon is now a competitor to all the sheet metal guys, you know, all the HPs and IBMs and Dells and NetApps and EMCs and so on. So I think that perhaps is the biggest disruption. You know, A lot of these incumbents, they were dealing with margins as if there was never going to be an end to this fest ever, right? And uh, all of a sudden, here comes uh, Bezos and says, you know what? I'm gonna, your margin is my opportunity. That's what he actually talks about, right? Yeah. Uh, and the investors love that concept. So I think that's the big disruption that's well, happening. He's, in the he's enterprise. commoditizing, which is changing the margin structure on his competitors. But he's also innovating because he's delivering what customers want. Absolutely. So I mean, that's an interesting, you don't see that very often. Yeah, because the ease of use part is the biggest friend of Amazon as well. You know, through a couple of programmable APIs, you're able to whip up an entire infrastructure without having to even pick up the phone and talk to somebody, right? I would say they turned the data center into an API. Right? Absolutely. And, and there's a huge land grab. Now, now, of course, you see VMware make a land grab <laughs> to bring the virtualization to, to networking and storage, but, but in a different way. You know, networking, they have sort of a cleaner story. It storage seems to be a lot more complex. Maybe there's an EMC factor there, I don't know. What's your take on VMware's push to try to virtualize the network layer and the storage layer? Well, they're also seeing the pressure from uh, Microsoft, they're seeing the pressure from OpenStack, they're seeing the pressure from Amazon as well. Uh, and those ELAs that we talk about, you know, especially the large customer base, mm -hmm. uh, they're uh, actually under a lot of pressure as well. So they have to find new streams of revenue and networking services and storage services actually are the next, uh, you know, I would say, natural streams of revenue. But I, I'm going to uh, disagree with you on the networking versus storage piece. Uh, they have a more imminent product in networking, uh, but the delivery is going to be more complex because changing networking is a whole lot harder. They have a much less cooked version of the storage, uh, you know, service. Right. Uh, but storage, inserting storage is easier because you can do it by a project. You can say, well, for this VDI thing or that branch office. Whereas uh, the networking stuff. supports all projects. Yeah, and yeah. networking is a fabric rollout. It's a mm. complete revamp of the entire infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, they're actually, they don't understand that space. I mean, even the reps don't understand what it means to sell networking and so on. And so I would say that the acquisition of Nicera is a great technology acquisition, but they have to figure out the go-to-market. That's why when you look at the reps selling Nicera, they have MBOs, they don't have real quotas because they're trying to figure out what it means. What the really quota mean. should be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Iraj, I got I to ask you, because everyone wants to know who's the hottest startup. You guys are tripling in size, or some number, you can probably give us the exact numbers. Plus you have ex explosive growth, right? As Dave said, you're on the rocket ship, and you know, people always want to either get a seat on the rocket ship or understand the rocket ship. Why are you guys so successful right now? Can you explain to the folks out there why you guys are such a hot startup? What about the company and what about the opportunity that's resonating with, with your, the customer base and, and the overall growth? Sure. Well, uh, part of it is just the technology. I think uh, it's a difficult product to imitate. You know, uh, what we've done by bringing a lot of these folks from uh, Google and Facebook and VMware and Oracle, and I mean, basically it's a great amalgamation of the best enterprise folks and the best consumer uh, cloud folks coming together and saying, what Google and Facebook can do in their enterprise, why, uh, in their data centers, why can't we bring that to the masses as well? Uh, now it's a, it's a pretty bold statement to say that you can bring all that goodness to the masses. You know? And along with it comes a lot of uh, devil in the details kind of things around visualization and ease of use and analytics and stuff. So we're really a very holistic company at that. You know, we, we take care of the left brain which is all the storage features, the data fabric part, the replication, the availability, the reliability, the scalability. But we're also very good at the right brain of uh, UI and ease of use and visualization and so on. So it's a very holistic, uh, I would say, story at that. But I think more than everything else, it's, it's uh, how we really inserted ourselves in the market and try to disrupt without being really disruptive. You know, I think uh, we've chosen some uh, workloads that actually are making a lot of headways and especially with virtual desktops and uh, with uh, a lot of virtualization that's happening around Microsoft apps and so it's on. Always, it's always a challenge as, a, as an entrepreneur and you, obviously you've been successful at it. Product market fit is what, uh, what we talk about. Obviously to sell the dream to the, to the investors obviously is one aspect where you want to be uh, envisioning the preferred future, but also the product market fit, but the market pieces was hard for you. Can you just go and talk, take us through what that progress was and kind of where you've tacked to today? Sure. Well, I know in 2010, uh, most people were naysayers. 
on this company because they never thought that compute and storage can come together. They're like, well, these are silos, you guys don't understand the enterprise, uh, servers are bought separately, storage is bought separately. And then uh, in 2011, when server-side flash happened with Fusion IO, a lot of the people started to scratch their heads. They're like, whoa, this looks mm -hmm. like it's going to be some real stuff happening on the server, right? So a lot of the naysayers became fence sitters. And then 2012 happened with people talking about cloud and convergence and things like that. Now all of a sudden, Nutanix is the hottest thing. Uh, well, STN helped too. I mean, the CIRA acquisition might have absolutely. pumped you guys up a bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everything software defined actually helped us as well. But I think uh, this was a process. It was a journey where uh, I would say 90% people being naysayers uh, three years ago to where we are today. And I think one of the reasons why we are hot today uh, is also because we made some bets two, three years ahead of everybody else. We said you know, we can connect the dots around where the world is headed and uh, make some bold moves as opposed to building just a cheaper, faster mousetrap. You know, we were not out there to just build a cheaper, faster storage appliance. So we said, you know, we need to really go and disrupt storage. In some sense, uh, completely get rid of the hub and spoke architecture of data centers and disaggregate the hub. You know, take that hub and put that close to the servers and do it in software. So it's, it's really nuanced though, because I, I remember back in 2010 and the skepticism around you guys, was, you guys was, in part anyway, you had the big guys all going after converged infrastructure, you know, trying to say, okay, we're going to migrate our base. Uh, certainly you had, Exadata was probably the first, right, is that fair? And then you had VCE coming in and mm -hmm. people looked at that and said, all right, maybe this is, and then certainly HP started pounding it and then Dell and everybody else. So some of the skepticism was, who's this little company, how are they going to compete? Um, and so, when you talk about disrupting storage, for example, talk about that a little bit more, because you do it differently. You mentioned Flash before. You guys inherently brought Flash into the architecture um, in a different way. Um, and, and I think some of those other larger guys that I mentioned are now starting to hop on that bandwagon. I wonder if you could talk about specifically how you approached things differently. You mentioned the bets you made before. What's really different under the covers? Sure. Well, uh, the message is very simple. You do not need a SAN or a NAS appliance to build your data centers. So that's where we really started. The premise is that that hub in a hub and spoke architecture, the dual controller uh, appliance is gone. It's gone forever. Because we take that sheet metal, that big iron approach to storage, and you make these little uh, virtual sheet metals, or virtual controllers in every server. That's the storage control that sits in every server, right? So uh, that's what I mean by disaggregating the hub and making a peer-to-peer -peer architecture where software glues all of these servers together and makes it look like one data fabric, really. And uh, it starts very small. It can start at three nodes, and it can go to 3,000 nodes in one fabric. You know, that's basically the essence of Nutanix, yeah. that you can take speculation out of your data center capacity planning and start very small and grow as you go. Really. And that's, that is dramatically different than, than virtually any yeah. other... And I also want to add that, you know, work. if you... If you look under the hood, what is Nutanix? You know, what, what have you really used under the hood? There's a lot of NoSQL, like Cassandra. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of uh, Zookeeper. There's a lot of MapReduce that we do inside. You know, the kind of frameworks that people use to uh, tackle big data uh, you know, problems a whole lot higher up in the stack when solving marketing problems or you know, genome sequencing or doing like market behavior analysis. We use all those technologies and frameworks to solve some very mundane problems in the data center, not the least of which is actually storage. You know, I think so. Nutanix is really a big data application built for the data center infrastructure. You know, so I've not heard it described that way because you, so I think you talk about <laughs> globally distributed architecture. You think about you know you mentioned MapReduce. You think about shipping function five megabytes of code instead of petabytes of data. You're building those disciplines in, in, into the fundamental architecture. Absolutely. So I mean, and if you look at this. Yes, we deliver NFS and iSCSI and SMB and we go and make this virtualization friendly, but it's essentially a big data application that can run other big data applications on top, can run virtual desktop uh, clusters on top, can run SQL Exchange and all that stuff. So it's a big data app that bridges the legacy. It basically says we can run other, big, other kind of legacy apps on top of us. You know? yeah. So all the tenets that people love big data for is around scale, around ease of use, things like that, we bring all of that under the hood and really 
uh, expose protocols that up until now were only used for legacy applications. We'll have to update our big data forecast on the Wikibon team, given the fact that you're now a big data application. <laughs> it's going to increase the market size even <laughs> further. Um, but we love big data, we get excited by that. So I want to drill down on that, because when you say big data, essentially it's, it's a great word that we love, everyone hates it, but we like it because it causes controversy and conversation, but big data is a philosophy, <laughs> it's a mindset, it's about measuring things, it's about software. You mentioned NoSQL, kind of that you guys have baked in multiple things for the general purpose market from leaders like Facebook, et cetera. Um, uh, but, what, but ultimately what you're doing is you're measuring, you're building in automated software or instrumentation to stuff that was once manual, yep. right? Is that fair? Yeah, okay, absolutely. So, so that could be kind of viewed as big data. But ultimately the infrastructure powering apps and big data is essentially modern, agile, what everyone's calling modern agile. So storage is a big part of that. Gelsing was up there talking about vSAN today. Uh, we're seeing a lot of server-side acceleration. So you're seeing compute with Amazon explode on the scene, almost unlimited compute in the future. And storage still is a bottleneck. And direct access and uh, SANS, SANS and DAS are a huge issue. What did you guys do with that? Are you commoditizing that? Are you going to just make it you know, plug and play? People want SAN and DAS, they whatever they do, and you guys are separate from that? Are you tied to it? Are you bringing that into the compute? Explain that whole storage piece that you've innovated. Sure. And then, and sure. then the management control on top. Yeah, I mean, uh, what vSAN announced today, or whatever VMware has been aspiring to do in the last uh, three, four years of their R&D efforts towards vSAN, validates what we are all about. We're basically saying that storage needs to be in pure software, it needs to be on the server, it doesn't need to be a special purpose appliance sitting as a dual controller uh, thing, uh, as, a, as a hub of hub and spoke, you know, really. Uh, but what we've essentially done is take an even bolder step than what vSAN is doing, you know. vSAN is going to be in the VMware stack, it's going to be in the VM kernel. We're saying that storage needs to be even above that. Why? Because the hypervisor is the new sheet metal which is commodity. It's the new sheet metal of the future. In the next five, 10 years, we'll talk about a VMware sheet metal and an OpenStack KVM sheet metal and a Hyper-V sheet metal and an Amazon Zen sheet metal and so on and so forth. So what do you do to really uh, look at these different computing silos, a VMware silo, a Microsoft silo, an OpenStack silo, an Amazon silo? You need these fabrics that run on top of them. So we've really pulled all of storage on top of the sheet metals and said, it needs to run everywhere. You need to have this piece of uh, storage fabric that runs in all these silos and, and really unifies them. In. And not just the data fabric part of it, which is around you know, reliability, scalability, and snapshots, and clones, and disaster recovery, and backups, and all that, but also the management piece on top of it. You know? I think uh, at the end of it all, this war, which is the, next decade on the data center stuff, is not going to be one on the left brain of uh, data fabric and storage and availability and all that. It's going to be about ease of use. It's going to be about UI. It's going to be about you know, really making it consumer grade. It's going to be about analytics. Yeah, and push button like kind of management, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. So all the things people talk about when they think of analytics uh, for a genome sequence or an analytics for uh, you know, what Target does on a point of sale uh, transactional system, the same kind of analytic systems have to be brought within the data center as well. You know? And I think to be able to analyze that through MapReduce, to be able to visualize it through HTML5, all that stuff is where the real value will be. Do you yeah. think that the pricing models are going to be free software and hardware, or free hardware with priced software? I think what you saw Juniper announce uh, about a month ago, this is I think going to be Kevin Johnson's uh, legacy to Juniper, decoupling hardware and software. We're going to have a very different discipline around uh, discounting of hardware and margins in hardware versus software is going to be order, order of the day, actually. And I think uh, we're seeing that. I know that uh, other 10 gigabit switch companies are talking about it all of a sudden. Juniper is talking about it. I think everybody has to really figure out a way to decouple hardware from software. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Some people are betting on the you know, free software still going through the hardware heroin yeah, that they're used to. And I think uh, one thing that uh, Dave mentioned around how are we also different, uh, we've done everything in software, pure software. There's no real uh, manufacturing you know, uh, skill sets that we put in hardware itself. So we can go and deliver all software as well without having to really 
uh, same and we need these hardware assists to really deliver. So we're hardware. getting the hook here, but I got to ask you one question because we were talking before this. You're a seasoned entrepreneur, uh, a lot of experience, a lot of, a lot of young guns are coming into the enterprise space from the consumer. We, you know, some stuff happening. I was talking about my Facebook page about the uh, Aaron Levy post at box.net. Um, and, and sincerely, you know, we want new blood to come in. There's other entrepreneurs. So um, the question is, the role of advice, uh, experience, plays in being a CEO in the enterprise. Uh, it's a hard nut to crack, it's always been a hard nut to crack, but with cloud, the consumerization, there's a little bit of a blending going on. Mm -hmm. So what's your advice, one, it, does experience matter, and two, what's your advice to the, the new guys coming in that might be watching? Well, the first advice I want to give to uh, entrepreneurs who want to come in the enterprise is bridge the legacy. And if you can't bridge the legacy and only talk about the future, you're dead. Like OpenStack is failing that from you know, just moment one, you know. VMware became big because it bridged the legacy really well. So that's one. Uh, the second thing is respect the channel. You know, do not try to do things direct. Do not try to uh, you know, optimize the bottom line when you really have to optimize the top line. You know? And the margins will come if you just respect the channel and have partners really think about you. And lastly, I think, uh, you know, just be bold and courageous. You have to be fearless, really understand that the big guys have a lot of chinks in the armor that you can go and take that So on. experience matters. Absolutely, I think, you know. Okay, so that's uh, one data point to our uh, debate. It's also on crowdchat.net. If you want to participate uh, with us in theCUBE, go to crowdchat.net slash VMworld, thought leader discussion there. It's the Twitter room, chat room, everything goes to Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, check it out. Uh, appreciate you coming on theCUBE. Dave, anything, any final questions before we wrap well, up? Well, I just, um, you, uh, I think first of all, you guys have done a great job of taking on the big guys. You are courageous. You mentioned the dual controller guys. Um, and there's a lot of process and people built up around those. So that, my, I guess my last question is, you know, what keeps you up at night? Is it unseating all those processes that are hardened around those, those, uh, those, those older architectures? And, and, and how do you sleep at night? Well, uh, <laughs> you know, competition has never re really given us uh, a lot of pause. Uh, I think as a company, We've been so self-assured about the big market that we're going after that if you just do Huge. our jobs well, and, and I think that by itself will build a very large business. I mean, the TAM, of what we're talking about, just servers and storage is 80 billion, but you add archiving to it, disaster recovery to it, it's a 200 plus billion dollar uh, I've TAM. pegged it at 400 billion in <laughs> your TAM. So, I mean, so we, need, we need half a percent of it. Throw some software in their services. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We need half a percent of it, actually, yeah. to really become a very large business. What keeps us awake is people, you know, when we get a lot of very good people together, how do you continue to have the look and feel of a small company, you know? Mm. Because uh, it's the heart that keeps pumping all the blood to the rest of the organs that really matters, right? And that heart is about the DNA of a small startup, you know? And at 500 people, can we defy the size and still continue to be agile mm. and be people friendly and be paranoid about uh, losing people, all that stuff? We need to be really keeping that culture alive. Maintaining that culture, yeah. That's right. where experience does matter, John. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think we'll all sleep well tonight given the uh, amount of coverage and uh, networking going on until the late hours of VMworld 2013 Packed House. D. Raj, thanks for coming on theCUBE. You're you. a great entrepreneur. Congratulations on all your success. I know you guys worked hard and uh, tripling in growth, it's rocket ship. And Thomas, congratulations. We'll be right back with our next guest. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back after this short break. Thank you.